Hello. This is Andrea Davis Pinckney, Vice President and Publisher, Houghton Mifflin Children's Division. Publishing books that touch the lives of young readers is a tremendous privilege. We who create children's books have the rare opportunity and responsibility to gently open the minds of young people. That is why I invited award-winning poet Marilyn Nelson to tackle the difficult subject of lynching in a book intended for young readers. A Wreath for Emmett Till is an evocative tribute to a 14-year-old African-American boy who, on a summer night in 1955 in Mississippi, was lynched. His untimely death helped spark the civil rights movement and change the face of American history forever. When I approached Marilyn Nelson about creating a book that addresses this disturbing topic, she was understandably reluctant. But just days later, she sent me a complete and a compelling manuscript. It was clear the idea had struck a chord. Marilyn has brilliantly crafted Emmett Till's story in the form of a wreath. She's done this through a little-known and sophisticated form of poetry known as a heroic crown of sonnets. The result of Marilyn's work will stir your soul and swell the hearts of those who read this book. It is at once haunting, beautiful, illuminating, and unforgettable. I invite you now to hear Marilyn Nelson herself give voice to her own mastery as she reads A Wreath for Emmett Till, which will be published by Houghton Mifflin Children's Books in the spring of 2005. August 2005 marks the 50th anniversary of Emmett Till's death, so the book serves as a special remembrance. We at Houghton Mifflin are proud and honored to bring you A Wreath for Emmett Till. And get some peace. A wreath for Emmett Till, R. I. P. Emmett Lewis Till, nineteen forty one to nineteen fifty five. One. Rosemary for Remembrance, Shakespeare wrote, a speech for poor Ophelia, who went mad when her love killed her father. Flowers had a language then. Rose petals in a note said, I love you. A sheaf of bearded oat said, Your music enchants me. Goldenrod, be careful. Weeping willow twigs, I'm sad. What should my wreath for Emmett Till denote? First, heliotrope for justice shall be done. Daisies and white lilacs for innocence. Then, mandrake, horror, wearing a white hood or barefaced, laughing. For grief, more than one, for one is not enough. Rue, you, Cyprus, forget me not, though if I could, I would. 2. Forget him not, though if I could, I would forget much of that racial memory. No, I remember like a haunted tree set off from other trees in the wildwood by one bare bough. If trees could speak, it could describe, in words beyond words, make us see the strange fruit which still ghosts its reverie, misty companion of its solitude. Dendrochronology could give its age in centuries, by counting annual rings, seasons of drought and rain. But one night, blood spilled at its roots, blighted its foliage. Pith outward, it has been slowly dying, pierced by the screams of a shortened childhood. 3. 
pierced by the screams of a shortened childhood, my heartwood has been scarred for fifty years by what I heard with hundreds of green ears, that jackal laughter. Two hundred years I stood listening to small struggles to find food, to the songs of creature life which disappears and comes again, to the music of the spheres. Two hundred years of deaths I understood. Then slaughter axed one quiet summer night, shivering the deep silence of the stars. A running boy, five men in close pursuit, one dark, five pale faces in the moonlight, noise, silence, backslaps, one match, five cigars. Emmett Till's name still catches in the throat. 4. Emmett Till's name still catches in my throat like syllables waylaid in a stutterer's mouth. A fourteen-year-old stutterer in the South to visit relatives and to be taught the family's ways. His mother had finally bought that white sox cap. She'd made him swear an oath to be careful around white folks. She'd told him the truth of many a Mississippi anecdote. Some white folks have blind souls. In his suitcase, she'd packed dungarees, T-shirts, underwear, and comic books. She'd given him a note for the conductor, waved to his chubby face, wondered if he'd remember to brush his hair. Her only child, a body left to bloat. 5. Your only child, a body thrown to bloat, mother of sorrows, of justice denied. Surely you must have thought of suicide, seeing his gray flesh, chains around his throat. Surely you didn't know you would devote the rest of your changed life to dignified public remembrance of how Emmett died, innocence slaughtered by the hands of hate. If sudden loving light proclaimed you blessed, would you bow your head in humility, your healed heart overflow with gratitude? Would you say yes like the mother of Christ? Or would you say no to your destiny, mother of a boy martyr, if you could? 6. Mutilated boy martyr, if I could, I'd put you in a parallel universe, give you a better fate. There is none worse. I'd let you live through a happy boyhood, let your gifts bloom into a livelihood on a planet which didn't bear Cain's curse. I'd put you in a nice, safe universe not like this one, a universe where you'd surpass your mother's dreams. But parallel realities may have terrorists too. Evil multiplies to infinitude, like mirrors facing each other in hell. You were a wormhole history passed through, transformed by the memory of your victimhood. 7. Erase the memory of Emmett's victimhood. Let's write the obituary of a life lived well and wisely, mourned by a loving wife or partner, friends, and a vast multitude. Remember the high purpose he pursued. Remember how he earned a nation's grief. Remember accomplishments beyond belief. Honors enough to make us oo slack jawed, as if we looked up at a meteor shower or were children watching a fireworks display. 
Let America remember what he taught. Or at least let him die in a world trade tower rescuing others. That unforgettable day. That memory of monsters. That bleak thought. 8. The memory of monsters, that bleak thought, should be confined to a horror movie world, a horror classic in which a blind girl hears one by one the windows broken out, an axe at the front door. In the onslaught of terror, as a hate-filled body hurls itself against her door, her senses swirl around one prayer, Please, God, forget me not. The body snatchers jiggle the doorknob, werewolves and vampires slobber after blood, the circus of nightmares is here. She screams, he screams, neighbors with names he knows, a mob heartless and heedless, answering to no God, tears through the patchwork drapery of our dreams. 9. Tears through the patchwork drapery of dream for the hanging bodies, the men on flaming pyres, the crowds standing around like devil choirs, the children's eyes lit by the fire's gleams filled with the delight of licking ice cream, men who hear hog screams as a man expires, watch fob good luck charms teeth pulled out with pliers. Sinners, I can't believe Christ's death redeems. Your ash hair, Shulamit. Emmet, your eye. Machetes, piles of shoes, bulldozed mass graves, the broken towers, the air filled with last breaths, the blasphemies pronounced to justify the profane, obscene theft of human lives. Let me gather spring flowers for a wreath. 10. Let me gather spring flowers for a wreath. Not lilacs from the dooryard, but wild flowers I'd search for in the greening woods for hours of solitude, meditating on death. Let me wander through pathless woods beneath the choirs of small birds trumpeting their powers at the intruder trampling through their bowers, disturbing their peace. I cling to the faith that innocence lives on, that a blind soul can see again, that miracles do exist. In my house there is still something called grace, which melts ice shards of hate and makes hearts whole. I bear armloads of flowers home to twist into a circle, trillium, Queen Anne's lace. 11. Trillium, apple blossoms, Queen Anne's lace, woven with oak twigs for sincerity. Thousands of oak trees around this country groaned with the weight of men slain for their race, their murderers acquitted in almost every case. One night five black men died on the same tree with toeless feet in this land of the free. This country we love has a Janus face. One mouth speaks with forked tongue, the other reads the Constitution. My country, tis of both thy nightmare history and thy grand dream. Thy centuries of good and evil deeds I sing. Thy fruited plain, thy undergrowth of mandrake, which flowers white as moonbeams. 12. Indian pipe, bloodroot, white as moonbeams their flowers. Picked, one blackens and one bleeds a thick red sap. Indian pipe, a weed which thrives on rot, is held in disesteem 
though it does have its use in nature's scheme unlike the rose. The blood-root poppy needs no explanation here. Its red sap pleads the case for its inclusion in the theme of a wreath for the memory of Emmett Till. Though the white poppy means forgetfulness, who could forget when red sap on a wreath recalls the brown boy five white monsters killed? Forgetting would call for conscienselessness, like the full moon which smiled calmly on his death. 13. Like the full moon which smiled calmly on his death, like the stars which fluttered their quicksilver wings, like the unbroken song creation sings while humankind tramples the grapes of wrath, like wildflowers growing beside the path a boy was dragged along, blood spattering their white petals, as he, abandoning all hope, gasped his agonizing last breath. Like a nation sending its children off to fight our faceless enemy, immortal fear, the most feared enemy of the human race like a plague of not knowing wrong from right, like the consciencelessness of the atmosphere, like a gouged eye watching boots kick a face. 14. Like his gouged eye which watched boots kick his face, we must bear witness to atrocity. But we are whole, we can speak what we see. People may disappear, leaving no trace, unless we stand before the populace, orators denouncing the slavery to fear. For the lynchers feared the lynchee, what he might do, being of another race, a great unknown. They feared because they saw their own inner shadows, their vicious dreams, the farthest horizons of their own thought, their jungles immune to the rule of law. We can speak now or bear unforgettable shame. Rosemary for Remembrance, Shakespeare wrote. 15. Rosemary for remembrance, Shakespeare wrote. If I could forget, believe me, I would. Pierced by the screams of a shortened childhood, Emmett Till's name still catches in my throat. Mamie's one child, a body thrown to bloat, mutilated boy martyr. If I could erase the memory of Emmett's victimhood, the memory of monsters, that bleak thought tears through the patchwork drapery of dreams. Let me gather spring flowers for a wreath, trillium, apple blossoms, Queen Anne's lace, Indian pipe, bloodroot, white as moonbeams like the full moon which smiled calmly on his death, like his gouged eye which watched Boots kick his face. This is Andrea Pinckney returning with Marilyn Nelson for a brief dialogue about the creation of a wreath for Emmett Till. 
Marilyn, the format of the poem, A Heroic Crown of Sonnets, is really quite striking. Can you explain what it is and why you chose it for a wreath for Emmett Till? It's very mathematical. (laughs) I should probably first explain what a sonnet is. A sonnet is a poem of 14 lines of rhymed, usually iambic pentameter, and a crown of sonnets is a sequence of seven interlinked sonnets in which the first line of the first sonnet becomes the last line of the last sonnet, and the last line of each sonnet is the first line of the following sonnet. So that's a crown of sonnets. A heroic crown of sonnets is a sequence of 15 sonnets which are interlinked like the normal crown of sonnets, except that in the heroic crown, the last sonnet is made up of the first lines of the previous 14 sonnets. So that's a heroic crown of sonnets. My crown is slightly different because the last sonnet is also an acrostic. So the first letters of each line, if you read down, spell out the phrase R-I-P Emmett L. Till. And let me say that you've, again, mastered it just spectacularly, and I know it's quite a challenge to uh, achieve this rare crown of sonnets. It's a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> your, your poem includes literary and cultural allusions from Shakespearean sonnets to recent world events, including the World Trade Center bombings. How do you think these relate to Emmett Till's murder in 1955? I think the relevance of some of the references has to do with the idea of terrorism. The Ku Klux Klan and racist organizations related to the Klan were the first organized terrorist group in the world. The period during which many lynchings happened was at the beginning of the 20th century, especially in the 19-teens. And this epidemic of lynchings was intended to terrorize the black population of the South. These were acts of terrorism. And I wanted to relate those acts of terrorism with the acts of terrorism that are happening in our era. And I think what's especially relevant, too, is that young people of today who are alive during the World Trade Center bombings can perhaps relate the two. Yes. Can you talk about the symbolism of the natural world included in your poem, the wreath of wildflowers, the voice of the tree witnessing Emmett Till's murder? Yes. The sonnet form was originally a poetic form that was used to declare love. And love poems very often use flowers as a symbol of romance. What I wanted to do is to turn around that tradition and describe something really beautiful in the form that is traditionally related to love. And I wanted to use the language of flowers to describe something horrible. I wanted to um, present a picture of a wreath made of white flowers, which symbolize, as the poem says, innocence and hope. So that the flowers for me are kind of complicated in that they refer to the tradition of the sonnet and to the older tradition of the language of flowers. The voice of the tree witnessing Emmett's murder is, I suppose, symbolic, but it's also a literary reference. It's a reference to a poem by Paul Lawrence Dunbar, early 20th century African-American poet, one of whose poems is called The Haunted Oak. And in Dunbar's poem, this haunted tree describes a lynching which it has witnessed. My poem makes a reference to the Dunbar poem. The story of Emmett Till's brutal murder, it's incredibly difficult and painful, and your poem addresses his death quite graphically. How do you think young readers and listeners are going to react to this? I hope they will react with shock. I hope they haven't been 
so jaded by the violence and brutality we see every day in the media um, that they will be unable to be shocked by this because it is a very shocking story. I hope they will react with empathy. Um, I hope they will understand and empathize with the horror that Emmett must have felt and his mother. And I also hope they will appreciate the history that's being portrayed here, that they will learn something about a very difficult and painful and brutal period in American history. Marilyn, I thank you. Uh, Clearly, there was a tremendous amount of thought that has gone into the creation of A Wreath for Emmett Till, and I I look forward to the reactions of readers. Thank you, Andrea, and thank you for suggesting I, I write on the subject.